All right, we're going to get started this morning. So last week, in case uh, you didn't know, was Easter, right? It was Easter. We get a couple of times, we get a couple of permissions from our culture to invite to church. And some of you may have been here last week, and that's why you decided to come this week, and, um, or you come one of the, the previous weeks. And, and so we have a couple times in our culture where everyone agrees, okay, uh, maybe I haven't been to church in a while, but I'm going to come on Easter. Or maybe I haven't been all year, but I'm going to come on Christmas and Easter. And we celebrate the resurrected Christ. We, I mean, many, the whole world changed because the tomb was empty. And we celebrate that on Easter. Um, it's historically, it's a fact. Uh, it changed the entire world. The reason that uh, we have things like, ideas like freedom and a person has value and people sit in churches all over the world and accept Christ, the reason is, is because the tomb was empty. And at our church, uh, one of the things that we do is we have two things that we want everyone to know. First of all, what's the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to win, train, sin. It comes from the Great Commission of the Bible. Win people to Christ, train them up in the Lord, and send them back where they work, back where they are, to win other people. So the ultimate goal is, hey, let's win people to Christ, right? Then what's training? Why do we train? Well, we, we need to train so that we can have a ministry. We need to learn the Bible. And then when we learn, as we're learning the Bible, not when we've learned it, because that will never happen, uh, but we, we, we begin to learn it and we continue to learn it. And as we um, do that, we understand immediately it's important to have a ministry. And each one of us have a ministry with just the people we know. We don't have to create something special. We're all around other people all the time. So that's the purpose. The vision of the church of Cross the Line is to serve your family, right? That's why we have a coffee shop during the week where we're available. We have a kid's playground. We, we do youth sports here in the evenings. Uh, there's all kinds of things we do. We want to uh, serve your family, but the second part of that is to grow your ministry. We want everything that we do to help grow your ministry. And many people spend a long time in churches where they're not taught about growing their ministry. And, and so that's one of the things that people have found a lot of joy in across the line is what? I can have a ministry. Well, absolutely, it's what God remakes you for uh, when he saves you. You're remade, you're born again. Why? So that you can have a ministry. Now, what the celebration of that is Easter, right? That's the day where we, we celebrate that that tomb was empty and we can have salvation. But there are problems that come with that because uh, we live in a world, and this is why we're gonna have this new sermon series called Broken. And let me tell you, the reason we're having this sermon series is because of your ministry. It's because of your ministry because there are tough questions in the world that the people that you wanna do ministry and that I do ministry with, there's tough questions, there's tough questions that are answered by the Bible with a biblical answer, and we need to answer them. So why Broken? Well, because you're gonna say, He's risen, he's risen indeed. God saved me and God heals me and yet uh, Christians still get sick, uh, they die, uh, people get cancer, right? Um, God saved the world but yet sometimes a child dies before their parents. Some, sometimes, excuse me, people in your family who you're close to who your life is built around, sometimes they die and you watch it and it hurts. And so the question is, if God has saved the world, if God offers salvation, if he's done all these wonderful, wonderful things, why is there so much hurt and pain and abuse in this world? This, this is a real question. And over the next several weeks, uh, a place that teaches the Bible has a lot to say about this. And we're gonna go uh, straight into God's word. now. I wanna say that this may be a tough word of God for some of us to get. This may be tough. But what makes it exciting is because we all start in a broken world, and we're gonna read about that today. But the, most people are floundering in this life, hurt in this life, not living the way God wants you to be born again and remade. The reason they're doing that is because some people sit in a church or out in this community and what happened? They got molested when they were a child. 
And it's hard for them to say, if I got molested or abused as a child, physically abused, then how could God let that happen to me? How could God let the person that was close to me die? How could God let my marriage dissolve like that? And these are real questions and there's real answers. And, and so we need to look in God's word so that your ministry grows, right? Serve your family and what? Grow your ministry. Why? Because we gotta win, train, send. It's, it's the way it works. And the truth is our ministry is to real people who have real pain with real issues. And we have them too, amen? We got them. We're still living with them. Well, to start, we're going to have to understand what Scripture says about itself. What does the Bible say about itself? So this is the beginning, and please keep walking through this, and please, if, you have, if you're doing ministry with someone, this series is a good time to start. It's a good time to promote it. It's a good time to watch it together if you do a Bible study, and, and these are questions that people have. Play part of the message and then do part of the study. But we're going to start with this scripture. It's found in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Don't, don't you find it weird that um, biblical books, almost every book that has multiple chapters in it, 316 is a good verse, right? For God so loved the world. Well, let's read this one. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So let's talk about this verse as we look at it just real quick. A lot of people um, have uh, about three things to say about a verse like this, and I want to cover them all this morning before we get started on our other scripture that's found in Genesis 3. What's the first one? All scripture is breathed out by God. Okay, we're going to come back to that one. The second one is, it's, uh, what's it for? For training in righteousness. Now, a lot of Christians agree with this part of the verse, that scripture is training for righteousness. And we like to even say in the church, we like to use the word holy. I, well, I'm going I'm to obey the scripture. Why? So I can become more holy. Understand that the definition for the word holy is, means to be set apart, right? It doesn't mean I've made myself almost like God. I'm set apart for, you know what? I could say this too. My vacuum cleaner is set apart for vacuuming the floor of my house, right? And good thing, because I got four kids and two dogs and it's gross sometimes, okay? You gotta vacuum. I need a vacuum cleaner that's holy to do its job. I don't need the vacuum cleaner to go out and shovel the driveway, right? Plug it in and catch on fire, whatever would happen, right? If I was trying to shovel my driveway with all the snow and stuff, that's not what the vacuum for. No, the, the vacuum is set apart. So God says in the scripture, listen, I'm gonna have people who accept me. And, and what I need them to do is I need them to be holy, set apart in ways that the world can listen to them. Now look at the other part of the scripture, that they may be equipped for every good work. So why do I adjust my life? Why do I change sin habits in my life? So that I can have a ministry, so that the community will listen to me, so that the people around me might hear the word of God. Well, the first part that we skipped over is that all scripture is breathed out by, good, uh, breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching. I I'm gonna tell you this, because you may have a background that's different than someone else's. Some places have it wrong. Some churches have this wrong because they didn't read their Bible. Uh, I've heard people try to say, well, the Bible's really close to the truth because it was written down by men and there's a mistake here and there. And uh, when uneducated uh, hierarchies and denominations started making this decision and talking like this, their approach to the Bible changed. And their churches stopped preaching the Bible because of really an education problem, and we have a class on that. And instead of understanding what the Bible says about itself, and that it's breathed by God, and God had inspired men to write it down, and he kept it perfect, holy, set apart for himself in the church. And, and some churches veered from the teaching and the preaching of God's word, and somehow they still call it church and they still meet today. But they're wrong. And if you have that idea that this will be a hard word for you because one of the two books that 
uh, they do that in our last sermon series. We understand people do that with the book of Revelation. Well, they also do it with the book of Genesis, and they try to say, oh, well, you know, uh, that's a myth. It's a story. No, the book of Genesis is quoted not only by Jesus, but by, all the, by several of the apostles in their books. And let, and let me tell you, it's so specific that when you understand God's word completely, you're going to understand that Genesis has something loud to say to us in the church. In fact, it answers most of the tough questions completely that we have, and we do ourselves a dishonor by not understanding what Scripture has said about itself in 2 Timothy 3.16. Amen? How many of you know the Bible's all true? Listen, it, it's the truth that we have in this world. If the Bible's not true, uh, life is nonsense, and you're an accident, and there is no truth. But God has made us uniquely special. You don't have to look five minutes past your own kid as they run up and say mommy or daddy to know that you're unique and special. And the human life is extremely complex and they still don't know what makes life life. Well, going through that, we have to look at our Bibles to discover what we're dealing with. And many of the hard things in life, like why is there pain and suffering and wars and fighting if God has saved it? Listen, look at the Christians around the world. Look at them. I mean, I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm set free, and all the great things of the Bible, and yet, uh, look, at the, look at the Christians in the early church, persecuted, murdered. Look at things right now. We live here, but many places in the world are persecuting and killing Christians today, and in fact, there's been no time in history because of the massive population of the earth, there's never been a time where more Christians are pers persecuted for their faith than today, and I know that's hard to believe because we sit here, but that's the truth, so why? Well, let's read together Genesis chapter 3, and we will continue to be in, in these first few chapters of Genesis, this whole series. We're going to look at this scripture a long time this morning. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Right off the bat, you're thinking what I would be thinking if I was you, and you're going to say, Austin, are you telling me that a snake is more crafty than like a wildebeest? or a lion, or something else I watch on, you know, a, a, an animal video. And, and what I'm going to tell you is, no, this is a name that uh, is given to Satan and to fallen angels, okay? Many times in the Old Testament, it talks about the beast of the field, and then it gives a description about what they're doing, and it's, it's demonic entities. So Satan is the most crafty of the fallen angels, okay? That's what we're reading here. And, and this is how the Bible speaks. We've changed our language. We have an English language, but understand this is, this is perfect in the way, the way the Bible presents it. And he said, talking about Satan to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the tree of the fruit, the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God has said you shall not eat of the fruit in the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate it and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now... There's a lot going on in this verse, and it's very specific, and it has a lot of things that we need to talk about. Um, understand the very first thing that Satan asks Eve is he questioned God's word. Eve had a word from God already, and she repeats it. He goes, did God really say don't eat the fruit of the trees? Satan already knows what God has told Adam and Eve. In fact, at this point, they've probably already lived in the Garden of Eden probably over 100 years. And, and she repeats back to him the truth of God's word, and he repeats back to her a little lie. She said, we can, we can eat the fruit, but not that one, not that one. This is how we choose God over sin. And he said, listen, that's not true. You won't die. And, and, and in two ways, uh, we can see later in Genesis he, that he was correct. She didn't fall over dead physically right then, but she did die later 
We have the genealogies of the people in the book of Genesis, and Adam lives like 942 years, and, and you think, well, that might be good, but uh, instantly he was dead in his spirit. Why is he dead in his spirit? Because he can no longer be with God. He is separated, his spirit is eternally separated from God. We celebrate last week, what? The fact of that your spirit Right now, if you choose to be with God, right, it's saved eternally. That part of you is saved. But Adam and Eve, we all come from them. And uh, how bad did those two people hurt you? How bad did that decision hurt you? You know, the first thing we want to do in our life that is a response to the broken world, right? All of us grow up in a world that's broken, We all do, Christian or non-Christian, and we learn to live our life broken. And we sing songs, but what do we sing this morning? We serve the God of miracles, so what are we talking about when we're talking about this broken life? We serve a a, a God in this broken world, and, and, and somebody will come to Christ, and they'll say, I can be healed. And I can be forgiven, and I, and I have joy. And the, and, the, and the outside world sets with arms crossed, and they go, we'll wait till you mess up. We'll wait till you get sick. We'll wait till you die. And, and all the truths uh, of, the, of the Bible that talk about, well, I thought you were going to be healed. Weren't the apostles, weren't they able to heal? Yeah, they were able to heal. But let me ask you, where are they at? They all died. It doesn't save us from physically dying. And, and, and what happens when, when we're trying to answer all these tough questions that the world has for us? I mean, uh, uh, aren't we supposed to be happy? What happens when I'm, when I'm not happy? Where's God then? You know, um, there was a, a girl, that, a young person who went to my youth group at another church a, a long time ago, and they were questioning many of the things of, in this world about morality. And uh, were, were, was commenting over and over on the morality and what they think and, and how they think it's supposed to go. And, and, I, and I commented because I, I care. I commented in a, in a, in a private way, a private message, uh, away from the social media, and I said, you know, I think a good place to start is the Bible. And and her response was, well, you know, the Bible was written a long time ago. What would the Bible know about 2017? Can you imagine that mindset? God's too stupid to figure out how you should live. Even though he created you special and all that stuff, uh, God's too stupid. He didn't know. You know how much immorality is in the Bible? Come on, you don't have to look even to the Old Testament, although it's full of immorality. You know in, first, you know in the book of Corinthians, we see in the church a stepson having sex with his stepmom. And by the way, the apostle goes, you know, don't do that. <laughs> you don't think God knows that there's going to be sexual immorality in 2018? Let's get a clue. And by the way, can you think about that thought process? God writes about the end of time in his scripture. You think he knows what's going to happen in the middle with you, who he created in his image to have free choice? Notice what she told us, God said, that if we choose the seed of sin, we'll die. That's what Eve told us. She'd heard the word of God. She knew the word of God. And she said, if we choose the sin, We die, and Satan says you won't die, and it's true. Many of you guys figure this out in your life. You choose sin all the time. We choose sin all the time, don't we? The fact is, until we choose the truth of the gospel, we choose our Lord and Savior, uh, we're dead. Eternally, we're separated from God. He's given us a free gift, and, and and so then, what happens when someone comes to Christ? What happens? A lot of times they'll come into the church and they'll say, Austin, what I want to do is I want to learn more of the Bible. So is there a group or a person or someone I can talk to or a group of people that I can learn with? Why? So I can learn the stuff that the Bible says because I want to uh, take the broken things of my life and I want God to start healing them. Right? That's what we do. And, And so why do we do that? To start learning more of the truth of the Bible. And so this becomes very difficult because we, we've got a lot of things going on in our life. And we've got a lot of fears and intimidations and insecurities. And, and, and we, we're trying to learn the Bible. We want to grow. 
but, but every time we don't know what the Bible says, what do we do? Or every time we don't believe the Bible, what do we do? We say, does the Bible really say that? The first thing that Satan does to the first family that affects you and I very deeply in a real way, it hurts us, the decisions that they made. Amen? You know that. You can feel it today. By the way, someday we die physically because of the decisions that our essentially mom and dad made, Adam and Eve. They made that decision. And for us, it hurts us. And when we're saved, what we do is we focus on Scripture, and, and many of our testimonies, many of the ways we grow and we become set apart to do ministry, they, uh, uh, we start broken, and as God heals, he puts, that, he puts us back together. And people feel guilty about it. People are like, Austin, I've lived my whole life this way. I've lived many years, 20, 30 years without Christ. I've lived my whole life. And, and you know what's amazing? We just sang it this morning. God's the God of miracles. You know what he does when he, when he puts our broken life back together? He does a miracle. You know why? Because he makes up for lost time that you can't do. How many of you guys know that when you made a good decision for Christ, other people started doing it all of a sudden? All of a sudden, when you went to church, someone follows you. You already live around people. How, how, let me ask you this. We've just said that Adam and Eve's decision hurts us. It does. How many, people's, how many people are hurt by your sin? And, and I know what our defense mechanism is. It's to say, well, Austin, not that many. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. You know why I know it does? Because God's word says it does. Your, your decision for Christ blesses the people around you, but when you take a part of your life and you say, does God's word really say that? Does God's word really tell me to live that way? I'm gonna do it my way. When you do it that way, let me, let me tell you what you do. Let me tell you what the Bible says that you do. You curse the people around you. What's great about our God is he takes a broken life and when we let him start piecing it back together, he does the miracles to do the work. Remember last week we talked about God always does his part, right? David and Goliath, Moses, all those things. They, they did their part and then God did the work. God always does his part, but he'll never do your part. He'll never do it. This is part of the problem people have with God. You know, if God is so great and he saves and he does all these things that are so great that, that the Bible talks about and preachers get up on stages and talk about every week, if God is so great, how come he let me get hurt? How come he let that happen to me? Well, after this problem that was caused by Adam and Eve, and after the problems that you cause, every single generation chooses sin, don't they? We always choose sin. Even if we've accepted Christ before that, we always choose sin. And, 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 so, and so God doesn't promise to make this world heaven. You're not going to live forever. You're not going to be free of trouble, not even if you're a believer. The reason we have freedom in Christ, the reason we don't have to live in fear, because we understand and accept that God has remade it for later. He saved our soul for eternity, and, and that's the answer. But guess what? He's going to give the, another person the freedom to sin. He's made it in their image. God wants you to desire him and want him, and so he's given you free will. And let me tell you, you may compare the hurt and the sin that someone did to you, but God's given you the free will to hurt other people too, and you've done it. You know, every, every parent has hurt their children, and, and, and some people struggle mightily with what, but honestly, you don't know what my parents did, and, and it's hard for me to forgive them. Okay, are you perfect? Because let me tell you, whether you have kids or not, you hurt the people around you when you live in this broken world, broken. You choose it. Every single time you choose it. And you know what? Our God is the God of miracles because he doesn't hold you to that brokenness. He repairs it. He, pit, he puts it back together. When you say yes to him, when you obey scripture, when you go, yeah, that's scripture and I'm following it. You know what he does? He puts it back together. And he's the one. He's the God of miracles. He's the one that catches it up. He's the one that makes your family go, okay, well, I've had these hurts and I've had these struggles. But you know what? Because you forgive, because you believe God, I'm going to too. And it takes some people years and years and years, and we got to pray for them, and we got to minister to them. But that's why it is in our church. 
Serve your family and grow your ministry. You know, another part of the scripture that in an instant they knew that they were in sin. They knew, that it says that they knew they were naked. And you're saying, well, Austin, how are you going to walk around the Garden of Eden and not know you're naked? You know, many commentators say because they were clothed in light. You can see this in the instances in the Bible where somebody comes into contact with God like Moses, just in the presence of God. And when he comes down the mountain, his face is shining. And the people that wanted to veil him, it's too great for them to look at. Well, think about before sin, how we could be in the, in, in, with God and, 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 and what that would be like. Well, many commentators said they were clothed in light. And the instant they sinned, that light began to dim. And so they're like, uh-oh, something's changed. Something's changed. In an instant they knew. And, and you know, not so much has changed today. Instantly we know when we're holding part of our broken lives for us, don't we? We know it. And to have the kind of ministry we want to we want to have, we gotta believe God's word. Remember what 2 Timothy said? All of God's word. You gotta trust it, all the whole thing. Why? Because our life is broken. And when we decide to live our life with this, with this broken model, listen. It curses people around us. And the instant we decide to believe God's word, God does miracles. He's the God of miracles. The miracle is you'll change your life. You would never change your life without God. So we've got a lot to go through with this series. And, and there are real people with real hurts. And you might be a person with real hurts that is struggling to believe God in certain areas. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And why do people get to do that to other people? God made you in his image, not make a robot. When, it, when God's word said he made you in his image, he made you with the choice to follow him or to do it your way. And the Bible says you could choose this day whom you serve. Listen to this. I'm going to say it twice. Listen. You can serve God or money. You can serve God or fame. You can believe in God or you can think you're God. You can forgive or not forgive. You can obey God or you can not obey God. And here's what I want you to hear. It blesses and hurts. It blesses or hurts all the people, all the family members that come after you. You know why that's true? Because it's been true since the beginning. You can serve God or money. You can serve God or fame. You can worship God or you can think you're God. You can forgive or you cannot forgive and you can obey or you cannot obey. And it will either bless or hurt all the people around you. Here's my question this morning. What do you want? We have a choice, but what do you want? Do you want God to, to start putting your broken life in areas? Even if you're saved, do you want God to start putting the broken pieces of your life back together? Then let me tell you what that ends up in biblically. Because all of it's good for teaching and training and building up so that you can have a ministry. Let me tell you. Simple. It blesses. The God of miracle moves and your life becomes service to the community becomes like Christ, and his kingdom grows because of you. We speak this often, but I want to say it clearly this morning. What do you want? Be honest, God has made you in his image. The, the last thing that Satan did is he said, I, if you eat that, understand this, you're going to be like God. Here's the truth. If you read scripture in Genesis, Adam and Eve... We're already like God. He made them in his image. Let me tell you, you're God's child. You're like God. You're like God because you can choose him. And God will always do his part. He promises to, to grow his kingdom, to repair all the times when you've, you, you've cursed, where, where, where you've broken You've helped break other people, and you've caused hurt in other people's life. And I don't say that for any kind of guilt here. Listen, God's forgiven the guilt. Get over it. Don't hang on to it. 
Ask for forgiveness and move. Let God be the God that heals and does the miracles. What do you want? Do you want to bless or hurt? That's the decision we make as we go to communion today. We take it every week, and if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to go take it. You can stand up and pray with people, or you can go sit down, but we do it as a community. Why? Because it's decision time. It really is. And God commands us. So, so will you believe God's word? Christian, will you, will you bless or hurt? We don't do this to feel guilty. We do it to know what truth is. And let me tell you, God's the God of miracles. It's not too late. And he will save through your decision, amen? As we go to communion today, it's decision time. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's time to do that. We want you to bless. We already know that you hurt. If you're, if you're a Christian and you're living in brokenness, can we believe God's word this morning? Can we believe it and start living the way he's uh, across the line? Can we do that? You know why? We know the answer is yes. And he's the God of miracles. You just move. God always does his part. He'll never do your part. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mighty word. As we go to communion, we pray that you bless each family and friendship in here, each individual, the crowd as a whole, Lord, and we pray for a mighty decision that w what we want is to bless and not to hurt. Lord, there's a big discussion about truth in our culture. You already decided it. You gave it to us. You wrote it down. You told us it was all good because it comes from your very breath. Lord, we believe it this morning. We hang on to your truth. We love you and we thank you. And as we go to communion, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.